Mr. Chair, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honored to speak before you today, and I would like to commend the Academia Engelberg for its initiative to organize this interdisciplinary conference on violence in human society. Clearly, violence is a complex phenomenon that takes many forms and often has a very broad range of possible causes. As a result, there is no one-size-fits-all solution, no single remedy to it. However, its risk factors and root causes are often similar. I'm here today to address the issue of armed violence and its interrelations with underdevelopment. In the last few years, armed violence has claimed around 740,000 victims worldwide every year. Low and medium income countries suffer from a disproportionately high share of these casualties. On average, their violence mortality rate is two and a half times higher than that of developed countries. In my daily work in charge of Political Affairs Division for Human Security of the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs of Switzerland, I deal with a broad range of human security issues. The core business of my division lies in the area of civilian peace building, conflict transformation, set in uh, uh, conflict settings. As you may be aware, civilian peace building has experienced a very dynamic development since the end of the Cold War. Over the past 20 years, we have witnessed fundamental and largely unexpected changes in global security. Most importantly, the last decades have seen a shift from interstate to intrastate conflicts. Civil wars and internal conflicts have significantly outnumbered the classic confrontations between states. Armed non-state actors have to, be, have to come to play an important role in today's conflicts, which are therefore often labeled asymmetrical. Unfortunately, the status of these non-state armed groups under international humanitarian law is seldom generally accepted and clear-cut. This is one of the reasons why indiscriminate violence that does not distinguish between combatants and civilians has become increasingly widespread. State fragility is another, another important aspect of the shift towards intrastate conflicts. Wherever a state is not capable of providing basic services to its citizens and maintaining law and order, armed groups often move to fill the vacuum. Currently, around 40 states are in danger of completely losing their monopoly on the legitimate use of force and are no longer able to physically control their territory. According to the World Bank criteria, about 1.2 billion people worldwide live in fragile states. All this may sound familiar to the interested observer. What is less well known is that notwithstanding recent escalations such as in Georgia or Afghanistan, the post-Cold War decline in the total number of armed conflicts worldwide has continued. Sub-Saharan Africa, while suffering from more, more from political violence than any other region, has actually seen the greatest decrease in the total number of armed conflicts in the last two decades. Most observers attribute the declining number of conflicts not only to the end of the ideological confrontation of the Cold War, but also to a growing international effort and commitment to effective crisis management, as well as both multilateral and bilateral peace building initiatives and mechanisms. As a matter of fact, since the 1990s, more wars 
have been ended thanks to negotiation than through a military victory. On the downside, around 40% of peace agreements failed within a period of five years, as, for instance, illustrated in Sri Lanka. Unfortunately, in many regions, the decrease in the overall number of armed conflicts does not simply translate into peace and security. It is a sobering fact that certain parts of Guatemala, Brazil, or South Africa, for example, while technically not involved in armed conflict, face a number of deaths from armed violence that easily surpasses that of a low-intensity low war. To put it in a nutshell, today's armed conflicts are interstate conflicts for the most part, which means that they are largely internal in nature. The total number of all types of armed conflict worldwide has declined in the last two decades. Meanwhile, many regions suffer from widespread armed violence, even though they are not necessarily involved in armed conflict. In many of these situations of endemic violence, the distinction between conflict and non-conflict settings has become blurred. Conflict and crime are increasingly linked. Moreover, the underlying causes of armed violence are often similar in both conflict and non-conflict settings. Let me briefly explain what we understand as armed violence, as this term may, might seem rather fuzzy to you. I would like to give three examples in order to illustrate this concept. Which of the following situations do we describe as armed violence? Situation one, combatants shooting at each other while civilians run for cover. Situation two, starring and displaced men, women, and children in a war-torn region. Situation three, urban gang members attacking each other with firearms in a deadly fight for territorial control. <coughs> well, our concept of armed violence actually encompasses all three of these situations. Not only does it take into account direct deaths in armed conflicts, such as soldiers or civilians, who are victims of gunfire, but also indirect victims to armed conflict who die as a result of malnutrition or easily preventable diseases. Moreover, and perhaps most importantly, the concept of armed violence also factors in death from armed violence in non-conflict settings, such as homicides due to endemic gang violence. This new focus allows us to concentrate on the negative effects that armed violence has on the, in, on the individual and the society as a whole, as well as on its most common risk factors, without holding the concept captive to a, a conflict lens. Up to recently, the major threat that armed violence poses to human security has mostly been associated with interstate and intrastate conflict. Clearly, armed conflict still poses an enormous challenge in our times. Addressing its causes and mitigating its effects remains a top priority of our work in the area of human security. In this respect, we can again picture the first of our three examples, soldiers or civilians who come under fire are at risk of dying a, what we call, direct death from armed conflict. On my slide here, uh, it's the grey circle, uh, representing around 50,000, 52,000 uh, uh, deaths per year. However, it is often forgotten that the numbers of such direct conflict deaths in armed conflicts are usually much lower than those of indirect conflict death. Depending on the conflict, an estimated two to 10 times more people die as a result of displacement and loss of access to food, water, 
and rudimentary healthcare. In an armed conflict, many people actually succumb to easily preventable diseases. This situation is illustrated uh, by uh, the image of starving internally displaced people in my second example. Here on my slide, it's the light blue circle standing for around 200,000 deaths per year. While armed conflict is still an important concern for human security specialists, the concept of armed violence has been developed to reflect a new, not very well-known reality. In absolute numbers, armed violence in conflict settings is only a relatively small part of the broader picture. Recent studies have shown that the numbers of death in non-conflict settings dwarf those that occur in armed conflict. And this takes us to our third example. Ur urban gang feuds, shootouts among drug traffickers, politically or economically motivated crimes, and many other forms of armed violence that occur in a non-conflict environment. They claim around 10 times more lives worldwide than armed violence in conflict settings. It's here on my slide. It's the big red circle representing around 490,000 deaths per year. In the past, uh, both conflict and non-conflict armed violence have mostly been perceived exclusively as a security issue. However, this view does not do justice to the reality on the ground. The burden of armed violence is heaviest in the developing world. Actually, less than 10% of all violence-related deaths occur in high-income countries. As these developed countries account for, about, for around 15% of the world's population, uh, their share of all deaths from armed violence is thus significantly lower than that of developing countries. Armed violence is often both cause and consequence of underdevelopment. Moreover, it constitutes one of the biggest obstacles to the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals of the MDGs, such as reducing by 50% between 1990 and 2015 the proportion of people who suffer from hunger, as well as the proportion of people whose income is below one US dollar a day. Why are armed violence and development so closely linked? Because in addition to human suffering and socio-cultural socio traumata, armed violence produces horrendous economic costs. These costs range from those associated with death, injury, and damage to property, through the increased burden on the law enforcement and justice sector, to the disruption of social services, the undermining of governance structures and economic opportunities. In developed countries, expenditure on law uh, enforcement accounts for around 5% of GDP. Developing countries, on the other hand, spend around 10 to 15% of GDP on law enforcement. Armed violence creates an environment of permanent insecurity and criminalization, such as racketeering, endemic corruption, trafficking of all sorts. Thereby, it increases the costs of economic transactions undermines investment, erodes human capital, and thus impedes sustainable development. At the same time, the context of underdevelopment and perceived inequality can itself be conducive to armed violence. Insufficient employment opportunities, highly visible economic and social inequalities, ineffective governance and service delivery, are among the most important structural risk factors for armed violence. As armed violence and uh, development are intrinsically linked, the international community has become increasingly aware that a holistic approach and decisive action are crucial to meet the challenges that armed violence poses to development. How can we meet these cha challenges in order to re reduce human suffering and foster uh, sustainable development? How can we assure 
that the efforts of national and international donors are coherent, coordinated, and complementary? How can we ensure that our approach is bottom-up and translates into locally and nationally owned projects that lead to a measurable reduction in armed violence? Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to present uh, to you now a, a diplomatic initiative uh, that Switzerland and a number of like-minded initiatives have instituted with a view to developing such a holistic approach to these complex interlinkages between armed violence and development. In 2006, Switzerland and uh, the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, launched the so-called Geneva Declaration on Armed Violence and Development. Back in 2006, when we started, uh, we had 42 countries uh, attending a ministerial summit in Geneva. Today, the initiative, this process, is supported by 108 signatory countries. Since 2006, Switzerland has chaired a core group of 14 states that lead the implementation of the Geneva Declaration. The core group is supported both by UNDP and from the civil society side, the Quaker United Nations office. The latter provides the important link to civil society organizations that are active in armed violence prevention and reduction. The Geneva Declaration Secretariat is hosted by the Small Arms Survey in Geneva. That's a center of excellence that works on issues of small arms and light weapons. The signatories of the Geneva Declaration seek to achieve measurable reductions in the global burden of armed violence and improvements in human security by the year of 2015. To achieve this goal, the implementation of the Declaration is centered around three pillars. The first of the Geneva Declaration's three pillars aims at raising awareness and disseminating knowledge about the problematic interrelations between armed violence and development, as well as about possible ways to address them effectively. Furthermore, it strives to improve coordination between international actors in this field. The second pillar aims at measuring and monitoring the types and extent of the linkages between armed violence and development, as well as the effectiveness of different programming approaches. And the third pillar of the Geneva Declaration aims at achieving measurable reductions in armed violence in particularly affected countries by designing and implementing effective and nationally owned programs. To raise awareness about uh, the interrelations between armed violence and development, as well as about possible ways of meeting the challenge they pose, the signatories of the Geneva Declaration have conducted several regional and sub-regional meetings, as well as a first ministerial review summit last fall in Geneva. In an effort to launch a discussion on the issue in the framework of the United Nations, interested member states have lobbied the UN General Assembly to pass a resolution on the interrelations between armed violence and development in November 2008. The resolution requested the UN Secretary General to seek the views of the member states and to submit a report on the issue. The substantive report has recently been released a couple of months ago and will be debated in the General Assembly on the 16th of November for the first time. Like the Geneva Declaration Group, the UN Secretary General's report recommends increased coordination among donor agencies. It also encourages recipient governments to include armed violence prevention and reduction programs in their national development and poverty reduction strategies with a view to improving coordination and complementarity. In order to devise effective ways to prevent and reduce armed violence, research on its impact and geographical distribution as well as evaluation of program, programming efforts are crucial to provide policymakers with the necessary data and information. 
Therefore, the second pillar of the Geneva Declaration promotes through measurement and monitoring. To this uh, end, the signatories encourage and support comprehensive research on armed violence as well as on the effectiveness and efficiency of different approaches to armed violence reduction. This is complemented by detailed country-level studies in different, particularly affected regions of the world. The Geneva Declaration Secretariat published comprehensive research on armed violence in its 2008 report on the global burden of armed violence. This, is, this report, I have brought a couple of uh, copies with me, but you also find it uh, on at the net. The report surveys the incidence, severity, and distribution of different types of armed violence in both conflict and non-conflict situations, from both large and small-scale violence in criminally and politically motivated contexts. It also assesses the economic costs of armed violence and its interrelations with development. Measuring the type, scale, and distribution of armed violence as well as its impact on development is also a prerequisite for the development of reliable goals, targets, and indicators on armed violence prevention and reduction. The signatories of the Geneva Declaration have set themselves the goal of achieving by 2015 measurable reductions, I uh, quote, measurable reductions in the global burden of armed violence and tangible improvements of human security worldwide. End of quote. The core group of states leading the implementation of the Geneva Declaration is aiming at the development of concrete goals, targets and indicators to make this progress measurable. In order to ensure effectiveness and complementarity of armed violence prevention and reduction activities, monitoring of past and current programs in the field is crucial. The Geneva Declaration Core Group gathers and disseminates information on which programs work and which do not in order to assist both donor and recipient countries in choosing the most effective approaches. The third pillar of the Geneva Declaration process probably represents the greatest challenge. Quite clearly, addressing armed violence on the ground in an effective and successful way is a complex and difficult endeavor. Any program that aims at preventing and reducing armed violence through a set of targeted and sustained interventions needs to take into account the local, national, and regional context. And again, there is no one-size-fits-all solution. Nonetheless, the specific risk factors associated with the onset and the persistence of armed violence are often similar and are becoming increasingly well understood. Highly visible social, political, or economic inequalities, systematic exclusion of minority groups, sharp macroeconomic shocks, the expansion of unemployed youth populations, growing demographic youth bulges, as well as easy access to narcotics and firearms, all related to the occurrence of armed violence. While it is often globally felt in its effects, armed violence is largely a sub-national phenomenon, since it is rarely distributed evenly uh, across the country. As a consequence, many successful armed violence reduction activities are devised at the city or at the town level by governments with reasonably good institutional capacities and often in partnership with non-governmental organizations and academic institutions. The signatories of the Geneva Declaration are convinced that successful armed violence prevention and reduction cannot be imposed by donors in a paternalistic manner. Pro programming has to be nationally owned and bottom up. However, the international community can facilitate and support such national efforts. Keeping in mind, though, that many of the most affected countries are fragile or even failing states, failing states 
Sustained national ownership is a very tricky issue. In order to support particularly challenged countries in devising effective uh, uh, programs for armed violence prevention and reduction, the Geneva Declaration Core Group plans to make technical assistance available. Toolkits and experts could help governments to design, monitor, and evaluate targeted programs with a view to building local institutional capacities for such activities. Further, more, it should help affected states to introduce effective armed violence prevention and reduction programs in their national development strategies. One organization particularly committed to developing best practice guidelines and recommendation, recommendations for armed violence reduction programs is the OECD. The OECD's uh, Development Assistance Committee, DAC, has proposed a set of different uh, possible interventions around four core elements. People, perpetrators, instruments and institutions. These four elements provide a useful overview of what key issues and stakeholders on violence programming should try to take into account. The first of the four core elements for programming lies with the people. More precisely, the victims and affected communities as a key focus. Generate, generating improvements in both our actual and perceived security needs to be our main goal. Programming should address both people directly affected by armed violence and those indirectly affected by its destabilizing effects. Most importantly, we have to keep in mind that armed violence is a highly gender-specific phenomenon. Its direct victims are mostly young men. Women and girls are often indirect victims of armed conflict, suffering from malnutrition and easily preventable diseases, as well as from sexual violence. Again, it is important to keep in mind that in armed conflict, two to ten times more people succumb to the conflict's indirect effects rather than dying a direct violent death. As for the perpetrators of armed violence, programming should try to take into account their degree of organization. Structure and violent dynamics vary significantly from state and non-state security actors to organized crime and use gangs, and finally loser networks as well as interpersonal and, or domestic violence. Perpetrators are also highly gender specific. Most acts of armed violence are committed by young males. It is essential to understand their motives. Programming needs to account for issues related to personal and community security socioeconomic opportunities, individual and social status, as well as issues of identity and belonging. Repression alone is definitely not sufficient to address these circumstantial and structural risk factors. In terms of the third element, instruments of armed violence, the supply and availability of weapons and ammunition together with the presence of explosive remnants of war, should be a key focus of comprehensive armed violence reduction programming. While certain constituencies repeatedly insist that guns don't kill people, firearms are certainly a major risk factor for armed violence and thus need to be addressed systematically. Recent years have seen the establishment of a number of international agreements to combat the illicit trade of small arms and light weapons. These international and regional efforts should be furthered and consistently implemented. In addition to such cross-border issues, it is crucial to address stockpile security, border controls, corruption and organized crime at both national and local levels. Finally, with regard to the institutional dimension of armed violence, programming should focus on formal and informal norms and practices, means of enforcement, as well as organizational structures. 
police, justice and defense reform and democratic oversight often play an important role in effective armed violence reduction. Through assistance in what is generally referred to as security system reform or SSR, donors can help, can help affected governments strengthen the rule of law and make the various formal and informal security actors both more accountable and more effective. Legislation as well as capacity and quality of governance of state structures should be analyzed and improved in order to enable equitable delivery of security services. Informal institutions, in institutions such as culturally accepted norms that support the use of violence and encourage arms holdings should also be addressed, particularly with the support of traditional customary or community-based organizations. Furthermore, in post-conflict post settings, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration of former combatants, the so-called DDR, is a key endeavor to stabilize the fragile balance uh, after an armed conflict. Offering opportunities for employment to former combatants in the security system and in the civil society are great challenges. Clearly, armed violence, uh, armed violence prevention and reduction requires a thorough assessment. It needs to take into account a set of complex factors around the four described core elements. Let me now give you a very specific programming example of a fairly successful approach on a local, regional and national level in Brazil. Rio de Janeiro is not only one of the wealthiest cities in Brazil, it is also notorious for its striking inequality and high levels of armed violence. The local favela slums are stigmatized and often lack the provision of basic state services such as electricity, clean water or security and justice services. Instead, most of these areas are controlled by heavily armed gangs of drug traffickers as exemplified in the film City of God that you might know. A local NGO called Viva Rio launched a program for awareness raising and gun control in the early 90s. Over time, it developed into a major disarmament campaign that helped to achieve a new national gun law in 2003. This so-called disarmament statute made it illegal for most civilians in Brazil to carry firearms. Viva Rio's push for stricter gun regulation was complemented by a voluntary gun turn-in campaign, as well as, and this is important, several projects directed at police reforms, youth, gender relations, and community development in the favelas. The NGO's efforts were credited as one of the main reasons for a 12% decrease in the number of gun deaths in Brazil between 2004 and 2006. Viva Rio's approach was locally owned and well diagnosed around the four core elements mentioned before, people, perpetrators, institutions and instruments. With regard to people in the local communities, the program focused on awareness raising, community development and social mobilization. It concentrated on income generation and job access for the perpetrators, who were mainly poor, young males between 15 and 24 years of age, that often had not even completed primary education. With respect to formal and informal institutions, Viva Rio lobbied for improved police training and reform, better police community relations, as well as gun control legislation. Backed up by a sophisticated communication strategy, free legal aid and conflict mediation, conflict mediation were provided to address the local culture of violence. As for the instruments at stake, Rio, Rio focused on voluntary gun collection and successfully lobbied for more rigid firearms legislation. The programming that Via Rio established in Brazil proved to be a sustainable long-term commitment. Its evidence-based approach allowed 
the organization to monitor success and ultimately support its projects and public campaigns with comprehensive data. Drawing from the positive programming experience, Viva Rio has also started to export its set of tools for armed violence prevention and reduction beyond national borders. In a promising effort of South-South cooperation, it aims at transferring its knowledge and best practices to Haiti, which is, as you know, the poorest country in Latin America and suffers terribly from endemic armed violence. This form of bottom-up knowledge transfer could serve as a model for future efforts in the framework of the Geneva Declaration on Armed Violence and Development. In addition to these first promising steps in transnational cooperation, Viva Rio also had a considerable impact on the policies of Brazil's federal government. Some of its pilot initiatives in social inclusion and police reform were ultimately mainstreamed by the state and applied to other regions beyond Rio de Janeiro. In 2007, the Brazilian government instituted PRONASHI, the National Public Security and Citizenship Program. This innovative program of the Ministry of Justice aims at coordinating public security and social policies with federal, state and municipal government bodies. PRONASHI is mainly targeted at public security professionals and young people between 15 and 29 years of and 15 and 29 years who are living on the verge of criminality or have already been in conflict with the law. Different projects in the country's most notorious metropolitan regions aim at improving the articulation between civil society representatives and the different security forces. Furthermore, multidisciplinary teams of social workers, psychologists and ed educationalists were formed to set up prevention and rehabilitation initiatives for offenders and young adults at risk of committing crime. Other projects addressed gender relations, education, cultural activities, as well as urban renewal. This was complemented by improved police training, increased efforts in prison security, and the fight against organized crime and corruption not least among members of the security system. Although there have been substantial budget cuts in the Brazilian government in the last few months, the Ministry of Justice will again devote more than half a billion US dollars to Pronashi uh, in this year. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, there are several options and approaches for successful armed violence prevention and reduction. But programming needs to be long-term and adequately funded. In order to reduce the global burden of armed violence, states, governments, donor agencies will have to significantly increase their support for armed violence programming. As you know, the UN has repeatedly urged developed countries to commit to an increase in official development assistance of 0.7% uh, of their GDP until 2015. Just as a reminder, last year Switzerland devoted 0.42% uh, of its uh, uh, GNP to official development assistance. Maybe it is time to relaunch the discussion about our responsibility in this regard. To sum up and to conclude, the international community has become increasingly aware that Apart from being a major cause of human suffering, armed violence severely impacts the achievements of and prospects for development. Both in conflict and non-conflict settings, it impedes developmental opportunities and heavily challenges the state in its responsibility to guarantee security and other basic public services sometimes pushing state institutions to the brink of collapse. Armed violence is definitely a major obstacle to the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals. As armed violence is both cause and consequence of underdevelopment, the issue needs to be addressed holistically and in the long term. The approach of the international community needs to be coordinated 
and anchored in an evidence-based approach. Monitoring and evaluation of programs need to be put together and communicated to allow, to allow donors and recipient countries to devise more effective programs in order to address this complex issue. Programming should, should obviously not only take into account the issue of weapons availability, but focus on a broad set of circumstantial and structural risk factors, particularly also regarding to basic education and employment opportunities. The approach that the signatories of the Geneva Declaration have been advocating is now gaining momentum in the United Nations and it is increasingly being put into practice in program, programming efforts on the ground. Nevertheless, many questions remain unanswered and much needs to be done to change the lives of communities and individuals who suffer from armed violence and its inhibitive effects on sustainable development. This challenging issue is one of our major concerns. I hope I have been uh, fairly successful in making you aware of the need to tackle the interrelations inter between armed violence and development. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your paper, which uh, is really very interesting in connection with uh, these programs and initiatives you have taken. Wait just a second, because even if you belong to the Swiss government, you get also a present <laughs> from the Forum Engelberg. <laughs> thank you, very much. I, I thank Thanks you so. very much. Thanks a lot. And uh, I just ask for one or two questions. Well, there seems to Everybody's be no need. Ah, here, yeah. Just to say that I think uh, this is now a perfect example of what I meant with complementarity earlier in the morning. I think uh, uh, what Switzerland undertakes here is, is, is very large. It involves uh, the governments. And, and we, as ICRC, we have identified actually in the same two contexts that you were mentioning, Haiti and uh, Rio de Janeiro, a job for us as well. I mean, that armed violence, even if it doesn't amount to the full scale of an armed conflict does concern us. So we have become active, but again, in a very, to keep our sharp edge in a limited uh, way in uh, 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 developing uh, medical services, evacuation, the first aid, and indeed uh, also going into prisons and discussing uh, with, uh, with the people there. And I think that, that indeed is an example of how the different uh, uh, components, NGOs, uh, Red Cross, uh, and governments can and, and should work together. Thank you. Well, maybe just uh, uh, not a response, but uh, just uh, uh, to uh, reinforce your point. I mean, I could have uh, also mentioned uh, the ICRC as an example. Uh, we, we've been uh, using your work in Brazil also as an example to illustrate uh, the spirit of the Geneva Declaration. Uh, we had, for instance, uh, the ICRC on a panel very recently at the, uh, the International Security Forum in Geneva to exactly uh, show what, in very concrete terms, this, you know, great ideas of the Geneva Declaration could, could, then, could mean in, in concrete uh, um, activities on the ground. So uh, uh, I very much commend the ICRC on, on, on its uh, um, efforts uh, Particularly, I think it's for the time being focused uh, on activities in, in Brazilian metropolitan areas. Okay. Once again, thank you. Uh, there is another last one. Uh, thank you very much. For Hello. I thank you very much for your excellent presentation, and uh, I would like to add another example to what you were saying about indirect victims of conflict, or what you call indirect victims of conflict. In Colombia, one out of uh, 10 deaths by arms is related to the political conflict between rebel or non-state armed actors and, and the government or between themselves. And the remaining nine of them are even org unorganized victims um, 
uh, of crime. For example, a spontaneous fight at a bar or a spontaneous reactions of violence to a particular subject, which shows the deeply rooted elements of cultural violence that have spread throughout the country. Um, and just to comment again on the example of uh, Viva Rio, one of the great examples that they have done also goes in cultural uh, peace or a culture for peace. They have implemented a program called Fight for Peace, um, which was uh, initiated as a sports initiative, uh, how to transform the lives of former soldiers of the traffic into um, active sports people and through sports use and utilize all of their adrenaline and need for control and power to, sort of, to something um, more constructive. But there is also an, an, a very active element of Viva Rio that is now a separate NGO, Fight for Peace, in transformation of culture, which is a, a very important aspect of what you were mentioning. Thank you. By the way, I could have cited also a, a few Colombian examples. You have in Colombia, for instance, the cities of Medellin and Bogota that are excellent examples of uh, implementing programs that are very much in the spirit of the Geneva Declaration. That is a mix of measures uh, focusing uh, on the one hand on uh, re re repressive uh, activities, but very much combined with uh, comprehensive programs in the field of socio-economic development. And the effect you can see in both cities uh, of Medellin and Bogota, they've been, uh, uh, I mean, uh, total disasters regarding armed violence uh, some five to eight years ago. And today, under uh, the leadership of a few enlightened politicians and, and with these comprehensive approaches, it was possible to create a totally different environment where you have a, a, a totally different standard of human security. Okay, thank you once again. And uh, 